Hi everyone, hope you've had a wonderful two weeks. As you can see, things have cooled off here. Anyway, we're actually going back into the studio because I have a very special guest today who has just completed a documentary titled The Life of Karl Maslowski. Well, you might be wondering why I have this old, beautiful camera next to me. Well, actually, my husband still uses it. We have a few of them in our household, though I cannot really imagine how people used to take pictures of birds and wildlife with uh, such a complicated setup. Well, anyway, we've been making uh, bird feeders for 20 years, and most of the pictures and videos that you've probably seen of our uh, feeders in action were taken by a wildlife photographer, Steve Maslowski from Ohio. I've invited Steve today to be our guest because he has just released a documentary about his dad, Carl Maslowski, who was one of the pioneers in wildlife photography and conservation in the 30s, 40s, and so on, until he retired in the 80s. So please welcome Steve Maslowski. Hi, Steve. Hi, Tatiana. Thank you. Ah, so nice to see you. You know, we watched the documentary a few days ago, and we were just mesmerized by the dedication to wildlife that your dad had and all the things that he had to do to take those pictures and videos of them in the old times. Absolutely amazing. And it also showed us how much the technology has evolved. Yes, uh, uh, dad was uh, very dedicated to to being outdoors and he wanted to show people. He, he got so excited about the outdoors. He wanted to sh to communicate his enthusiasm and what he learned and what he saw to other people. Uh, so he took up photography simply so he could show other people what was out there. And somehow Dad had an instinct of what made a good photograph. He had just basically uh, the basics in training. He really didn't know much about photography. He wanted a camera for the simple purpose of showing people what he saw. Yes. And that he did. But uh, he had the idea that if you wanted to photograph a bird's nest, you had to get up level with the bird's nest, even if the man going up 100 feet or something like that. It's, he just he just knew what he wanted it's and amazing. Uh, was willing to go to whatever he, he whatever lengths he could to, to get it. Mm -hmm. There yeah. were in the documentary, there are a lot of pictures actually of your dad over the years. Who took those pictures? Do you know? Uh no, there there is an interesting photo though of the of Dad with his first camera, and Dad had all sometimes mentioned a, a friend named Peter Koch who was a press photographer, roughly Dad's age, in Cincinnati, and and uh, a, a woman from Australia contacted me after she saw the film and said. Peter Cook was my grandfather. I have a picture of the same camera in the same place with Peter at it instead of your father. So, so uh, uh, Peter Cook took that picture, and apparently Peter had gotten a new camera, and Dad bought that camera for eight dollars from Peter Cook. Now, maybe I get it too complicated, but in any event, uh, <laughs> they were picked up a hook and crook by whatever means he could get. Uh, and I really don't know who took the ball, but I do know about that one shot of Dad with the camera in the marsh. Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, so much beautiful photography in your documentary. So tell me, uh, what was it like growing up with your dad? Well, you know, it was just Dad. I never uh, thought about it at all, except uh, Dad and I did share uh, a love of outdoors. We spent a lot of time. Well, hunting and fishing, my dad was an avid sportsman, and uh, eventually I got into bird watching with him. But as a young young guy, I was always out there uh, chasing something, and um, uh, you know, I just and I really didn't know that Dad had any stature until I began working on this film, and and I, you know, I don't, nobody wants to learn about Dad, but uh, some people told me, you know, you really ought to do a story about your father. So I said. What if I listen to the press? You know, you can't always trust the press. They'll, they'll build things up. And so I, I listened to the press and I looked at some things. And I thought, yeah, he was an interesting guy. And then the more I got into his early childhood, of course, by the time I began working, he was in his 60s and sort of set in his ways. But, but when he was a kid, he was phenomenal. And I, I was really impressed. So I, I, I felt good about uh, making a film of an interesting guy. But there is one aspect about Dad that, that sort of 
separated them from most of the remarkable people in in that day and age, and there were a lot of remarkable people, is that Dad, through his life, had accumulated a mass, a mountain of audiovisual materials. And here was all this material, all about Dad, about his work, about things he did, you know, his writings, his pictures, his movies. And, you know, it just cried for a story on the storyteller. And it was it was so, a wonderful it was a wonderful story. We really enjoyed that. Yes. Uh, well, I thought it. Uh, uh, I thought he had an interesting life too. Absolutely. And there were things that I just didn't know about him. You know, his early childhood. I didn't know that, as, as he said, he grew up dirt poor. He just never talked about it. Wow. And Go your ahead. mom was inv- involved as well, right? So you mentioned her briefly. She was she was there all the time. It seems right early on and then the kids came uh my, my older sister my older brother and then i'm a twin i've got i'm a fraternal twin and when we came along that really closed the door on any further wildlife adventures with my mother she had her hands full <laughs> and, and you were so, the wild things uh, uh yeah we were <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly gay. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, you've been a wildlife photographer all your life as well, right? That's that's your career. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, when did you start? Uh, you know, like we, my my kids, we have a lot of equipments at home. So my, even my three year old already has a camera, and they go around the backyard and they take pictures. So you know, they're probably going to say that they started taking pictures as they were still in diapers. What about you? When did you take your first? Uh, you know, cameras just didn't enchant me. It was uh, too too static, too sedate. And so, I, as I said, I was out running around. I, I, I couldn't sit still. And then I got out of college and uh, uh, sort of floated around for a year with a degree in literature. Uh-huh. And, and Dad, but I love the outdoors. I always love the outdoors. And Dad said, well, why don't you come work with me? So I had to learn cameras. Uh, when I got out of college, and uh, I, I discovered that I had, uh, uh, you know, I grew very fond of cameras, and I and I particularly loved the excuse to be outdoors, whatever it took. And uh, so, uh, for Dad, cameras cameras were not his passion. His passion was communicating about nature, and for me, cameras were not my passion. My passion was being outside. Right. Uh, photographing birds or foxes or whatever I could just say anything to the outside. Right. And uh, so cameras were a means to the end. Right. And yeah. what about your other siblings? Did they get into photography as well? Or is it just you? <laughs> um, well, my, my twin brother, as I say, were fraternal twins. He joined two uh, a couple of years after I got to work. And, uh, uh, you know, he, I was sort of a rough carpenter in our world, and he was the finished carpenter. Okay. So even though we never got along, if you know anything about fraternal twins, they, they bad had There's a lot of competition. But in that, we could get along because I could sort of get things roughed out. Dave could come in there and put those fine-tuned touches to things. And he had, it was interesting, he had a different sense of color than I did. He was much more sensitive to color and... Um, so Dave worked with me, but my older brother, who is in the film, yes. uh, who's a historian, yes. um, he worked for Dad for a while. But I came along and 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 uh, realized, and Pete realized, he knew all along. He had no sense of how to use a camera. He just had no sense of it. And I came along and thought, oh my gosh, I can finally beat my brother or something. <laughs> I'm a better photographer. That's what, so, you know. That's what we did uh, about you. Know, you. Uh, about your documentary, there's a lot of humor and history, actually, in your documentary. There are a lot of things that we learned. You know what all, What was also fascinating is how your dad concentrated on, you know, the area that he grew up in, you know, Cincinnati and Ohio. And it's always, people always try to go somewhere else to discover wildlife. But I guess we all forget that there's still so much stuff, you know, so much wildlife around us. Like, take our backyards. If you leave it alone, there's so much stuff comes to you, right? Is that what you've been doing as well? Like, I mean, you have so many birds in your backyard. Yeah, you're just proselytizing the area that where where we are. And, and 
you know, we're in Ohio. And this land is very rich and it has touches of north, touches of south. You know, we've got everything here. We cover, we represent what we photograph or what we have in Ohio represents about half the continent. And you get out west where the grand animals are, the mm-hmm. elk, the bears, uh, the mountain lions. You know, and that's a very small segment of the nation, really. So uh, uh, we, we do have a lot here. It, endless topics to photograph. Just endless. Yes. And uh, you're, if, you're still taking pictures for us. And every time you send us just like the birds that we here in Quebec just never get. And you're not that far south from us, but still, what a fascinating place to live. Uh, uh, it is, yes. I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I've often wondered in the course of my life whether um, whether happiness comes from where you live or from what's in your heart. And, and for better or worse, I stayed in Ohio and said, well, I got to find happiness in here. And then, uh, you know. Yes. And I'm, whether I have or not, who knows. But anyway, I've survived. So, all right. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you so much. Uh, so we'll be sharing the link to, to your documentary with our followers, and I'm sure they will appreciate and learn just as much as I did. Um, if there are any, yes, they, do, you, do you have anything else you would like to share with us? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> Rome feeders are the best. <laughs> I really think so. <laughs> That's right. I know. And, uh, I wish your dad was uh, around. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know they can always google the film if they would like on vimeo yes uh i don't know that you've given the full title I will, if yes. i might so we will yeah, share so. everything all, all right. right all right well uh, thank you so much we'll be in touch for more photography and videos my pleasure take thank care, you Tatiana. take care okay, bye, bye. Lisa Syria was uh, rafting down the Colorado River when she came upon a family of golden eagles with their babies sitting on one branch and then there was a, a bald eagle sitting right under them. She was a bit confused because she didn't think that the two eagles would ever hang out together. Hi Lisa. Wow, weren't you lucky to be doing a rafting trip down the Colorado River. Glad to hear that there's still enough water in it. Even better, you got to see a family of golden eagles with their youngsters perched on a branch in plain view. However, you found it a bit confusing to see a bald eagle perched on a branch below them in the same tree. Here's my take on it. First, I'm going to assume that the bald eagle in question was an adult, or at least of an age where the head and tail were showing white. I say this mainly because many bird watchers might have a difficult time telling a first year juvenile bald eagle from a juvenile or even an adult golden eagle. But yes, it probably is a bit unusual to see both of these species of eagle sitting in the same tree. However, in my opinion, the golden eagle is a fiercer predator overall than the bald eagle, if only because it usually hunts larger prey and depends less on carrion. Having physically handled both species in captivity and felt the power of their feet, I'm even more convinced. In the case of your sighting, those golden eagle adults likely did not regard the bald eagle as any serious threat to them or their young nor would they risk the chance of getting injured by trying to make a meal of the bald eagle. The size difference is just too close. So it really wasn't a case of the two species hanging out together, but more of a situation where they were both just using the same convenient tree perch for resting. Remember in the spring before the gardening season started, at least here in Quebec, we talked about natural uh, pest control that you can use in your gardens. Well, not only did we plant a lot of marigolds without tomatoes and peppers and carrots and so on, we also used a variety of nasturtiums. And right now this is like my most favorite plant flower ever. Not only are they so beautiful and colorful, uh, like you see, we planted one pot, just the flower, as a decoration then we planted them with peppers you know to keep the aphids off uh, in the bag like this it hangs and then we also have a pot with peppers and nasturtiums and everything is doing so great we also have nasturtiums uh, in the ground with carrots and peppers and other herbs and they all seem to be happy coexisting. Another thing that I love about these flowers is they attract bees and hummingbirds and they are also completely edible. So you can eat the leaf, you can eat the flower. Flowers actually look so pretty in salads. And then when you look for these pods right here, before they dry out completely, 
you can also eat them. They're a little bit spicy, but I really like that. Try it out. This could have been a better time to talk about purple finches because every August my feeders are covered in purple finches. Have you ever heard what Roger Tory Peterson called them? A sparrow dipped in raspberry juice? You know, when I heard that expression, it really helped me distinguish purple finches from house finches because now I find that house finches have a lot more orange in their plumage comparing to purple finches. Uh, the next problem is distinguishing immature female purple finches from house finches. What I do is I look for a whitish eyebrow on their face. If it's there, then it's a purple finch, and if it's not, then it's a house finch. Cornell actually has these wonderful images of the two birds, and when you look at it, you can really see the difference. Just like other finches, purple finches come and go. It all depends on conifer cone crops. Uh, here in Quebec, uh, some populations uh, stay all year round. Uh, other populations migrate south for the winter and then come back to Canada to bring in the spring. But their migration is really stretched out. Fall migration can start in August and go all the way to December. And then spring migration can start as early as February. But on the west coast, they are present all year round. Because they're a finch, their diet is mostly seeds, buds and flowers. They eat bugs, but not as much. They love bird feeders and happily help themselves to sunflower seeds. The first time I saw a male purple finch on my safflower seed, I was a bit surprised. But since then, it's become the norm here. Another way to attract purple finches to your property is to grow a variety of trees because they like their buds. So apple and pear trees maples, ash, poplars, juniper, they will even eat poison ivy seeds. Purple finches change their song with the seasons. They basically have three types. A warbling-like song in the winter and early spring, a territory song during their breeding season, and then a variotype song in the fall and also early spring. Even though purple finches are quite widespread, they haven't really been studied as much as other birds. They seem to be monogamous and pairs keep to themselves during their breeding season and then they flock with other birds, especially pine siskins, during the winter. Both females and males build a nest. Females lay about four eggs and they're really reticent to leave the nest while they're incubating. Both parents feed the young by regurgitating food, which is mostly seeds. Just like house finches, purple finches accept cowbirds' eggs, but as you might remember, from David's video, cowbirds young don't really fare so well because they need insects to survive. Purple finches young fledge when they're about 13 to 16 days old, but they stick around close to the nest and parents feed them for some time afterwards. Well, that's it, that's all for now. Enjoy Steve's uh, documentary about his dad. Um, I hope you can plant some nasturtiums, maybe if not this year, maybe next year. Our photo contest is still open. It's I'm just looking, not staring. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.